Good day, everyone, and welcome to Wings of Faith Ministries and today's Thoughts from the Word. And we want to wish you all a Happy New Year. Some of you will be seeing this on YouTube on the Friday before New Year's, and many others of you will be viewing this on New Year's Day on Sunday on Facebook. So we appreciate you every each and every week, and we, we wish you and your family a happy new year's i want to share with you today from the book of exodus chapter 3 the book of exodus chapter 3 it has been a very tumultuous three years and we have seen a lot of uh, things happen we've seen especially within the church world in the last three years, we have seen buildings emptied because of the pandemic. Many have not returned to church. Churches have had to find new ways to reach out to people. A lot of it has been online. And of course, the world around us is in a lot of turmoil and the, the fallout from the pandemic. The good news is, is that none of this has taken Christ by surprise. Christ knew long before this pandemic came that it would happen, and he knew the fallout that would occur to both the world and the church from this pandemic. And so we want to discuss, where does the church go from here? What is the plan to go forward? And that's what we want to talk about today. And I want to entitle uh, this message to you, this New Year's Day, called on-the-job training. That's what we want to talk about today. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 3, where Yahweh encounters Moses. We're going to start at verse 1. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness, and he came to Horeb. The mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, Moses called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hevites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Then we want to go over to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 4, and we want to begin... At the first verse. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. And then finally to the end of John, John chapter 21, and beginning at verse number 15. 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fashion a belt around you and take you where you don't wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me. Father, my prayer today is that only the truth will be spoken and only the truth will be perceived by those who hear these words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses had been a career shepherd. He had spent 40 years of his life in the land of Midian, tending to his father-in-law's assets. He had married a woman, Zipporah there, and had a, his first boy. He found himself in Midian for those 40 years because he was a fugitive. He had left the palace life in Egypt for the shepherd's life in Midian because he had killed an Egyptian. And so here he was, a career shepherd, tending his father-in-law's livestock, and he had taken them to Mount Horeb. And on this given day, probably the strangest thing he had ever seen in his life, as he's tending sheep, he sees a bush that's on fire. But although the bush is burning, the fire is not consuming the bush. Moses decides that he's going to go over and take a look at why the bush is not burned. Once he goes over there, an encounter with God happens, an encounter with Yahweh. And this is what I find unique and amazing about this encounter. God will introduce himself to Moses. He will say that I am the God of your father and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God will even tell Moses, his name, I am that I am, or Yahweh. But the conversation does not end there. Immediately after introducing himself to Moses, Yahweh asks Moses to go on a mission, a mission that will deliver a nation from another nation. Now, this is no small task. And for the last 40 years, Moses certainly was not trained to be a leader and a deliverer of people. But Yahweh says to him, go. I want to send you to Egypt. I want to deliver your fellow Israelites out of that nation. And I want you to take them up to Canaan into their own land that I will <coughs> give to them. Now, I want you to think about this today. Today, one would say, well, to do a job like that or to minister before God and to people like that, why well, you would at least need five or six years of seminary training before you take on something like that. But Moses didn't have any seminary training. The Lord had said to him, 
You're going to take your brother and you're going to take your staff. That's going to be the tool of your trade. And you're going to go to Egypt and you're going to have on the job training. And that's really what it was for Moses. On the job training. God would reveal to him bits and pieces of what he was to do. But when he got to Egypt, it was basically revealing to him one plague at a time how God would deal with the Egyptians. Moses was never given the whole picture of what was going to happen. God would speak to him piece by piece, and Moses would really do on-the-job training. Once those people were delivered, Moses had to learn to become a leader out in the wilderness, how to deal with a huge throng of people that were now under his care, and how to minister before the Lord. All this happened while he was on the job, because he had been given the command, go, go and do it. Hundreds of years later, the Gospel of John will make a little side note that we just read in chapter 4. If you read the Synoptic Gospels, you would be led to believe that Jesus' ministry followed that of John the Baptist. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not say that the ministries overlap. But in John chapter 4 and 3, we realize that the ministries of Jesus and John did overlap, at least by a few months. But what I find interesting here is that as we see the call of the disciples, who were fishermen by trade, four of them, another one a tax collector, we're not told what the other disciples were uh, employed with or in, but we are given the impression in John chapter 4 that very early in their encounter with Jesus Christ, that after meeting him and becoming his disciples, that he immediately put them to work. They were immediately partakers and participators in the ministry of Jesus Christ. John tells us, that it was not Jesus who baptized those who came to him. As the ministry grew, and it grew very quickly, surpassing that of John the Baptist, the disciples had to take on the mission of baptizing those who came and heard the message and believed. It was only probably a year and a half, maybe two years at the most, when Jesus sent the disciples out two by two on their own to minister to towns and villages that he had planned to preach at. He gave those disciples authority to heal people, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. And they had only followed Jesus for probably a year and a half to two years at most when he gave them that mission. On the job, training. Many times we are asked to do things that we may not believe we're capable of doing. The disciples were not preachers by trade, far from it. And yet, right from their encounter with Jesus Christ, like Yahweh with Moses, he put them to work, not as simply hearers who received, but doers Jesus would say to them, freely you have received, now it's time to freely give. And he put them to work. In John chapter 21, Peter would have his first one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus that is at least recorded in the scriptures. He had denied Jesus at the palace Three times he denied even knowing the Lord. There had been no one-on-one -on -one conversations that we know of between him and Jesus ever since that denial. But here on the shore 
of the Sea of Tiberias, Jesus met up with seven of the disciples as they were fishing. When they knew Jesus was on the shore, they brought their boat in. Jesus allowed them, through a miracle, to catch 153 fish. And as they brought the fish ashore, they all had breakfast together. And then we have our one-on-one -on -one meeting between Jesus and Peter. Three times, <coughs> Jesus will ask Peter, Do you love me? And three times Peter will answer, Yes, you know, Lord, that I love you. But you will notice that each time that Peter answered that question, that Jesus readily replied, Feed my sheep or take care of my lambs. Not only was there an introduction, a relationship, but also a mission immediately. Only 40 days later, this same Peter, who had denied the Lord in the garden, would turn around and be preaching a message in the center of Jerusalem, beginning that mission empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter would experience on-the-job training. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, Peter will be in the town of Joppa. He will be on a roof awaiting a meal that's being served. Peter will have a vision in which God will show him that he is to call nothing unclean. Peter will really not know the full meaning of that vision until a few minutes later when the Holy Spirit will say to him, I've revealed something to you. Now there's men waiting for you outside. Now you're going to do something. You're going to go with these men. You're going to do something that a Jewish person would never do. You're going to go to his house, to this Gentile's house. That's what you call on-the-job training. I give you these examples today because I feel that as we enter the year 2023, we've come through a very tumultuous time in the church. The Pew Research in the United States revealed that over 40% of ministers were looking for other jobs other employment because of their disillusionment of what's happened in the past three years. But as I said to you at the beginning, none of this took Jesus Christ by surprise. He was well aware there was going to be a pandemic. He was well aware there was going to be a fallout from it and how it would affect the body of Christ. But now, I believe in the coming year, 2023, two things are going to be imparted to us, the body of Christ. The first one is go. It's time to start doing. For the last three years, we have been reeling from the events that have hit this planet. And now it's time to resume a new mission in a new way. God is saying to us, go. It's not a mission that we're totally prepared for. Moses was not prepared to go to Egypt. The disciples would have felt they weren't prepared to take on the ministry that Jesus had asked them to do just a few months after joining the team. I'm sure Peter was not prepared in his mind to take on the mission that Jesus sent him to take on. And yet these men obeyed the call to go. Moses went to Egypt. And the disciples carried on the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't prepared. They would have never told us they were prepared. And they didn't get the whole vision of what they were to do laid out for them. It was given to them piece by piece. But in their obedience to that call to go, they saw God, the Holy Spirit, work with them 
with signs, wonders, and miracles, confirming what the Lord Jesus had told them to do. God never reveals the whole plan. He didn't reveal it to Moses. He never revealed it to very many people in the Old Testament. It would be given to them piece by piece, and it would require their obedience when he said go. But the good news was God never failed them. He always undertook. Yes, these men, both Old Testament and New Testament, men and women, made mistakes along the way because we're all flawed human beings. But they believed God. They trusted God. And although they may have felt they weren't equipped for the mission ahead, God undertook for them. God confirmed his word, and God was with them in every endeavor that he asked them to do. Going forward, I believe that in 2023, that God will speak to many in his body the word go. We won't feel we're prepared. We won't feel that we're ready. But I do know this, that we serve a big God and we have a wonderful Savior and Lord in Jesus Christ. And God never gives you a task to do unless he gives you the total enablement to perform that task. Yes, it's on the job training. That's the way the scriptures have laid out that the men of God of past and present have always served the Lord. It's always been on the job training. The good news is, is the Lord is with us through all of it. You may not be a member of a church or part or feel that you're part of the body of Christ. And as we start this new year, you may have been affected greatly, you or your family, by the events that have happened in the past three years, the turmoil. We've gone through tumultuous times. There is no better time to come to the Lord Jesus Christ than today, to ask him to take over your life and to lead your life from this day forward. Yes, it's a day-by-day -day experience. It's on-the-job training. But the Lord takes charge of your life. And you can rest knowing that your sins are forgiven. You're walking in Christ's righteousness. And Christ has a plan for your life. And so we, I leave you this message today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with two words. Go as he tells you to go. And remember... It's on-the-job training. The Lord will never fail to call you to do something and not enable you to do it. Let's pray. Father, in the holy name of Jesus, we thank you for this time and for a new year. Father, we pray for your body, the church. We pray for your grace and mercy to be upon it. We believe that this year in 2023, that many of us will hear the word, go, I'm sending you. None of us will feel that we're prepared to do what you've called us to do. We will have to trust in you that as we start out in our missions, that you will provide all the enablement that we need to fulfill them. For those who may not know you this day as we start this new year, we pray that they would call out to you, Lord, that you would come into their hearts as they call out. And Lord, we pray that you would teach them to trust you for all the necessities of life. We pray, Lord, for your grace and your mercy to be upon all those who view this in the coming days. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day, Happy New Year's, and we'll see you next week.